Despite the ongoing licensing issues, SpaceX at Starbase is steadily marching towards the Starship's fifth integrated flight test. Following the successful propellant load test and pre-flight checkouts, the company de-stacked Ship 30 from Booster 12 on Monday afternoon. Following the de-stack, Ship 30 was relocated to a parking spot near the launch pad, suggesting that the ship is unlikely to return to the build site in the coming days. Teams removed the booster alignment pins from the launch mount lately and sent the booster transport stand back to the build site, indicating that Booster 12 won't be removed from the OLM in the near future. Maybe they are planning more tests in the coming days with Booster 12. In the meantime, teams resumed tower arm upgrades and repair work that had been paused for the propellant load test. Extensive welding work was carried out to strengthen the arms in preparation for the booster catch attempt. After the welding was completed, the arms underwent testing. They were lifted to the top of the tower, fully opened, and held in that position for over an hour and a half. After the hold, they were closed and lowered back to their resting position at the base of the tower. Since the fourth flight in June, the arms have undergone significant repairs, such as upgrading landing rails, replacing actuators, and reinforcing parts with additional welds and doubler plates. Several catch practice tests were conducted in the past months with the B14.1 test tank and also catch simulation tests at the top of the tower to mimic the booster catch operations. Given the high stakes of the catch attempt, SpaceX will only proceed with the fifth integrated flight test once they are fully confident in the tower arm's ability to successfully catch the returning booster. The FAA is still reviewing the licensing application and evaluating safety concerns raised regarding SpaceX's operations at Starbase. Only after they are satisfied with the actions taken and fixes implemented by SpaceX will the license be issued for Flight 5 liftoff. Meanwhile, SpaceX continues explaining its side, detailing why the issues raised against them are not genuine safety issues, but rather what they call unnecessary analysis. The company is receiving support from several congressmen, questioning the FAA's delay in the licensing process and urging the agency to speed up the procedures. Earlier this week, SpaceX President and COO Gwynne Shotwell addressed the Texas House of Representatives, firmly defending the company's stance on these matters. Good morning, I'm Gwynne Shotwell, President of SpaceX. SpaceX commends you, Mr. Chairman, for your vision and leadership in establishing the Texas Space Commission. At a very high level, we have a number of recommendations. For sure, we want to continue to enhance regulatory efficiency so that regulation does not hold back technology and innovation. Updating legislation and regulations in the state to protect individuals and the public from, uh, from potential hazards associated with launch while allowing freedom and flexibility for us to continue operations safely and efficiently. What are the regular regulatory, I guess, hurdles or impositions you're referring to? What sort of protections are you looking for or um, would like to um, avoid? So, by the way, we are not afraid of regulation, right? It helps keep uh, businesses thriving as well as the community safe. Um, we work very closely with organizations such as TCEQ. Um, you may have read a little bit of, uh, of nonsense in the, in the papers recently about that. Um, but uh, we've, we're working quite well with them. All I'm saying is, as this business grows, you will en probably enhance the regulatory environment. And there's just a caution that... Um, you really want to make sure that regulation doesn't impede progress. We are regulated by dozens of bodies uh, with respect to launching at the federal level. There are noise, sonic booms that will occur uh, with launching, especially as we try to bring that vehicle back. Um, so we work closely with the environmental organizations, both the state as well as the, the federal level. After the first Starship flight, you may have seen the basically the engines dug a hole under the under the launch mount. Now to protect that from happening again, we built this kind of upside down shower head to basically cool the flame as the rocket was lifting off. That was licensed uh, and permitted by TCEQ. The EPA came in afterwards and didn't like the license or the permit that we had for that and wanted to turn it into a federal permit, which we are working on now. It's one thing for an approval to take maybe months, but if federal level we can build a rocket and get it prepared for launch faster than we can get the bureaucracy to approve us to, to, to launch. Are there other investments you're seeking? or We have a detailed money? list. We'd be happy to come okay. meet with you. It's time, so we'd like to see it. Understood. Thank you. Thank you.
Unexpectedly, on October 2nd, a local notice to Mariners was issued, signaling a potential Starship launch between October 12 and 19. Additionally, NASA has already reserved its WB-57 aircraft, typically used to track Starship flights, from October 13th to 26th, though it could be for other activities. It is really surprising that the launch could happen this month, given that SpaceX has not yet secured a launch license. Moreover, the FAA reaffirmed on October 2nd that the licensing process would be completed only by late November. This discrepancy raises doubts about the actual launch timing. However, SpaceX's decision not to return Ship 30 and Booster 12 to the build site after the propellant load test hints that they may be anticipating an earlier license approval. We'll have to wait and see how this develops. The construction of the second launch pad is advancing rapidly at the launch site, alongside preparations for Flight 5. Teams recently began excavating the area for the Flame Trenches Foundation. Recent developments suggest that SpaceX may be building a mobile orbital launch mount for Pad B. Similar to the new static fire test stand at the Masseys, the new mobile launch mount carrying the full-stack launch vehicle would be positioned over the Flame Trench during launches. Unlike the fixed launch mount, mobile versions will offer greater flexibility, a quicker turnaround between launches, and simplified maintenance by allowing repairs to be conducted away from the pad. Parts for the second launch mount have started arriving at Starbase and are now being assembled at the Sanchez site. The assembly officially began on Tuesday morning when the first corner section of the launch mount was lifted onto the assembly stand. Unlike the circular launch mount ring at Pad A, this launch mount is expected to be square-shaped, a new design approach for Pad B. The structure will include the outer 20 booster quick disconnects, plumbing, wiring, and other essential support systems housed inside. As the assembly progresses, more design details will emerge, offering a clearer picture of how it will operate. SpaceX is likely to construct a similar flame trench and launch mount at Kennedy Space Center for Starship operations. The old-style launch mount legs at LC-39A were dismantled some time ago, and there has been little visible activity at the site since. It is expected that SpaceX will resume work at LC-39A once Pad B's construction at Starbase is completed and its operations have been tested with a few launches. By learning from Pad B's operations, SpaceX can refine its approach and apply these insights to future developments at Kennedy Space Center. Super Heavy Booster 14 has recently been transported to the Massey's test site to begin its pre-launch ground tests. This booster is expected to undergo a couple of cryoproof tests in the coming days. These tests allow engineers to gather crucial data on the booster's structural resilience under various flight stresses and confirm the plumbing's reliability. After completing the cryoproof testing, the booster will return to the build site for engine installation in preparation for static fire testing. Currently, Booster 14 is scheduled to be paired with Starship 33 for the seventh integrated flight test. Ship 33, the first Block 2 Starship prototype, has already been assembled inside Megabay 2. Teams are now finalizing the plumbing and electrical systems before initiating the pre-launch test campaign. The aft section, engines, and other components of Booster 11, recovered from the Gulf of Mexico, arrived at the Massey's facility last week. Booster 11, launched on the fourth integrated flight test on June 6, successfully performed a powered targeted landing in the Gulf after stage separation. However, the booster suffered a catastrophic breakup upon touchdown and subsequently sank into the ocean. By analyzing the recovered components, SpaceX can investigate the booster's post-flight conditions and gain insights into the failure modes experienced during splashdown. Meanwhile, the marine vessel HOS Ridgewind, which assisted in recovering Booster 11 parts from the ocean, has returned to the splashdown zone to retrieve more remnants of the booster. At the McGregor test facility, SpaceX performed an impressive nearly 15-minute long Raptor engine test on a vertical test stand this past week. This test, lasting 898 seconds, is one of the longest Raptor tests conducted to date. SpaceX might have performed the test to gather extensive data on engine performance, particularly under prolonged operation. This kind of long-duration test allows engineers to assess the engine's reliability, efficiency, and response to sustained thrust, which is crucial for future missions. It is highly likely that the engine tested is a Raptor V3, the latest iteration of SpaceX's Raptor engines. For more details on Raptor V3, including its features, specifications, and design improvements, you can check out my previous video linked in the description. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. 
SpaceX successfully launched its Crew-9 mission to the International Space Station from Cape Canaveral on September 28, marking the first crewed flight from the historic launch pad, SLC-40. The Dragon spacecraft, Freedom, carried NASA astronaut Nick Haig and Roscosmos cosmonaut Alexander Gorbunov to the station. Haig, the mission commander, is a seasoned NASA astronaut and colonel in the U.S. Space Force, who has previously logged over 200 days in space. Meanwhile, Gorbunov, who serves as the mission specialist, is a Russian cosmonaut making his first flight to space. The Crew-9 mission is unique as it carried only two astronauts instead of the usual four, with the remaining seats reserved for NASA's Butch Wilmore and Suni Williams, who flew to the station on Boeing's Starliner spacecraft in June. NASA brought the Starliner back to Earth uncrewed in September because of concerns about the performance of its reaction control system thrusters. Wilmore and Williams are currently on an extended stay aboard the ISS and will return to Earth in February next year, along with the Crew-9 astronauts. After the successful launch, the Dragon Freedom capsule separated from the Falcon 9 upper stage and then embarked on a planned 28-hour journey to dock with the ISS. Freedom successfully docked with the ISS on September 29 at the station's Harmony module. Following docking, the hatches were opened, allowing Haig and Gorbunov to enter the station. With their arrival, the total population aboard the ISS increased to 11. The crew is set to conduct a variety of scientific experiments during their six-month stay, contributing to research in biology, human physiology, and technology development aimed at future Mars missions. Despite the successful launch of Crew-9, an anomaly occurred with the Falcon 9 upper stage during the mission. SpaceX confirmed that the second stage missed its designated landing target zone due to an off-nominal deorbit burn. The engine firing is designed to drive the stage into the atmosphere for a destructive re-entry and a landing in the South Pacific near New Zealand. Although it safely landed in the ocean without causing any public injuries or damage, this incident has prompted an investigation into its cause. SpaceX did not provide additional details on the incident, but said that as a precautionary measure, they have grounded its Falcon 9 fleet, pending further analysis of this incident. The FAA has stated that they are closely monitoring the situation and require a thorough investigation before any further launches can occur. NASA is also following up on the incident alongside SpaceX's efforts to determine the cause. This is the third time in three months that SpaceX has grounded Falcon 9 launches. In July, a Starlink mission faced an upper-stage Merlin engine malfunction due to a liquid oxygen leak, causing the satellites to enter low orbits and re-enter the atmosphere. This issue paused launches for 15 days. And in August, a booster tipped over and exploded on a drone ship while landing, resulting in a two-day halt. It's unclear how long SpaceX will pause Falcon 9 flights following the latest anomaly. The China Manned Space Agency unveiled its first lunar spacesuit at the Third Spacesuit Technology Forum, held in Chongqing on September 28. The unveiling ceremony featured prominent Chinese astronauts Zhai Zhigang and Wang Yaping, who demonstrated the suit's capabilities by performing various movements such as walking, squatting, and climbing a ladder. The new lunar spacesuit is characterized by its striking design, primarily white with red stripes inspired by traditional Chinese armor. The suit is designed with advanced features and specialized protective materials to endure extreme lunar conditions, such as radiation and temperature variations from 120 degrees centigrade during the day to minus 130 degrees centigrade at night. Unlike the extravehicular activity suits used in low Earth orbit, this lunar suit focuses on flexibility, allowing astronauts to move freely in the challenging lunar environment. The helmet includes a panoramic anti-glare visor for better visibility and built-in cameras for documenting lunar activities. A multifunctional control console integrated into the chest area simplifies the astronauts' operations by allowing them to manage various systems easily. The Chinese Space Agency spent four years developing the new lunar spacesuit, ensuring it is well-equipped for future missions. The suit has undergone extensive testing in simulated lunar environments for several months to guarantee reliability. The unveiling of the suit represents a major milestone in China's goal of landing astronauts on the moon by 2030. With advanced features that enhance protection and mobility, the suit is crucial for enabling scientific research and exploration on the lunar surface. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.